Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the second session of the Cross 150 Lecture Series. Rebonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue à la deuxième session de conférence pour célébrer le 105e anniversaire de, de Cross. Notre session cet après-midi aura des présentations de des Women Dead Song, Sue, then Don Fisher, and Jane Clayton. Our presenters this afternoon are De Wani Datsu, Don Fisher, and Jane Clayton. They'll let you speak for up to 45 minutes, and they'll take questions at the end of the presentations. You don't have any presentations, but just about 45 minutes, and on us, if possible, we'll have a question after each presentation. And our premier presentation this afternoon is De Wani Datsu. And he will talk about the History of Lacrosse in Kahnawake, Kahnawake, how the Warriors and Lacrosse players basically the role in the evolution of Turtle Island. Uh, Imani Datsu, also known as Louis DeLille, is a 2014 inductee to the Ontario Cross Hall of Fame as a player and builder. He's been an educator in his community since 1975, after graduating from McGill with a bachelor's degree in education. His experience in lacrosse goes back to the mid-1950s. He has had the benefit of hearing lacrosse history through the oral traditions of elders of the Six Nations Confederacy, and continues in lacrosse today, acting as an elder advisor to the Kahnawake Survival School of Lacrosse Team. The Dupuy de l'Obtention, so the Diploma in Education at the University of Miguel Juan Lulus, all Catholic, Soisant Kings, the Simply Come Educator Communitaire. So, the experience on Sport de Crosse, Raymond de Dupuy des années 50, il a eu de bonne fortune d'écouter l'histoire de lacrosse dans le cadre de tradition orale des années de la Confrérie des Confederation de Six Nations. Il poursuit en force ses activités de cross en tant que conseiller aîné de l'équipe de cross de la Kanawagi Survival School. Bonne chose. Où est-ce que je vais Je vais danser à ce qu'on garde ouest, ça n'est pas que je vais. Les gars disent que c'est de nouveau là, de ne sont pas dix. Ne wa hi ra so ai wa gwe gu jin ho da 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 wa ne zio hun za de da ni da wa ni da su da ga da da ni wa ra de ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne un gwe su a ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne ye ti ni sto ha zio hun za de ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne ga ne ga ru niu ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne gu zu su a ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne oh de ra su a ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne oh hun de su a ti ye ti ni wa ra de ne oh nun kwa su a. Te uti ni warado ne John Hekma, te uti ni warado ne Gahisuma, te uti ni warado ne Gayeri ni Gawerage, te uti ni warado ne Garunda Suma dano Ogure Suma, te uti ni warado ne Gundirio, te uti ni wa te uti ni warado ne Ozidon Ogunga, te uti ni warado ne Yunki Sota Asuntanka Garakwa, te uti ni warado ne Gayeri ni Gawerage. Te uti ni warado ne ye ti so togu radi weras. Te zida ni warado ne sungwa zia choke neka garakwa. Te uti ni warado ne zio disto kwarunyu ti karunyade. Te zida wa ni warado ne sungwa ya dizu. Ona toni ore ne wagadiri watkweni duka tenu sige ni guhru. Iza ne e zawa ni guragusu zawa kwa dagu. Stuma ganyagea wagadadi ne zi Sungwa ya dizu ne rao wa gi te hunci kwaks te waardu, sport of the cross. Wa huni ze jinae, kwa nekne runungwe hunwe wa tunci kwaage ne te waardu te hunci kwaks. Ona nuwa u munca gwegu te hunci kwaks a gwe, ne runungwe. Stoa French, en français, a che sui do ani datsu. Je suis très heureuse à parler de la sport de cross ici. Je demeure à Kanawaki. Mon français est pas bon. Now I'll switch to English. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to open in the language of, uh, I guess, of, our, of my ancestors, a language that probably existed here 5,000 years ago, just showing you that the sport of lacrosse has evolved through many, many years of, uh, of development and so on. I was able to speak, as I said, with elders throughout the Six Nations Confederacy to kind of uh, backtrack and give you an overview of what happened. Now, uh, 
a lot of the stories, in some cases, were written. Sometimes they're passed down. But as we go through it, we'll we'll get a, a fine, uh, I guess, um, idea of what 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 we're doing. Uh, before contact, there was much time for our people to, uh, I guess, hunt sports, do things of that nature. So in terms of lacrosse being a sport given to us by the creator to entertain him is fine and good. It's also a medicine game, which is played when people aren't feeling well and different nations had different ways of uh, doing this game to, to cure people. Uh, as Europeans came in, there became less time to play lacrosse because uh, we had to worry about the fur trade and where we were going to get our, our weapons to uh, save ourselves. So as elders say, lacrosse over those times was lessened. But nevertheless, it was, it was always there. It was there for the young people to learn, uh, in effect, to become soldiers, to, to, to become uh, warriors. Uh, running with a stick through the woods and having to defend yourself, uh, picking up a ball and obviously uh, avoiding contact with bigger boys, you, you certainly learned how to defend yourself. And also, some of the games weren't necessarily played just in a field. Sometimes they included part of woods, so it wasn't out of the ordinary for somebody to jump from behind a tree and kind of uh, go after you. And in those days, remember, there were no referees. So it was kind of everything goes. So now as, as things evolved, and we'll get to it as we get on later, that certainly rules came into effect and they had to because uh, there was a time when the sport was based on violence. Those who know hockey will say uh, as a I don't know which GM said it. If you can't beat them, if you can't beat them in the alley, you can't beat them on the ice. So certainly, that was taken out. As far as I know, in the 40s there was uh, lacrosse leagues, and they were so violent that the uh, the mayors of these uh, towns around Ganawaga actually closed off the sport and said, you know, this can't happen here because literally the players and the fans were having these extra curricular activities uh, between periods and so on. So it was, uh, it was stopped. Uh, okay, so getting back to, as I say, when the Europeans came, so there was a lot less lacrosse played. We know that <coughs> nations often tr settled disputes with the, uh, the games, and as we said, they would accept the result of the game to solve the dispute because it was the will of the creator that the winning team took the decision and therefore were, were in, in, in essence the victors. So gradually, I guess with more contact, it seems that the spiritual side about medicine and settling disputes uh, kind of faded out and you got into more of, uh, of Europeans seeing the game, uh, kind of taking it up and then as we say in Montreal in the mid 1800s, there were uh, teams uh, that were sprouting up in various areas, again, from elders who I spoke to. I'm fortunate to live across from a man named Mike Jacobs, who's a cousin of mine, second cousin. His father was born around 1901, and his father, who I remember uh, in the 50s, because I was born in 1951, and he passed away in 1957. This man was actually born in 1868. So many of these elders never spoke English, but they passed the stories down through their, their sons and grandsons. And as I said, I spoke to Mike Jacobs, uh, about 82 years old, so he remembers many of the stories about the evolution of lacrosse and how it was after 1867. He mentioned to me that as part of the, uh, I guess, civilization of lacrosse, his father, and well, his father and grandfather were considered to be professional ath uh, athletes in lacrosse. So he told me that on some occasions in the 1870s, 80s, they went down to Boston to be hired as, uh, if you want to say, mer mercenaries to play for teams in the Boston area. So that's one of his recollections of uh, stories told to him by his, uh, his grandfather. But 
I also wanted to mention that as, as lacrosse got into the 1900s, Gunawaga and Aguazasne, now Aguazasne is not mentioned too much in, in some of the things, but they were a community that was really related to Gunawaga since both nations were Ganyagehaga. And they went off towards the Cornwall area. But many of the games in the um, 1860s, 70s, were made of teams from Gunawaga and Aguazasne that played with the Shamrocks and different teams that, were, that sprung up around the Montreal area. So we must acknowledge the, uh, eff the efforts and the participation of our brothers from Aguazasne who are Kanyagehaga people also. Um, as lacrosse went into the, uh, <coughs> the 50s, I just want to tell you a story about my first recollection of lacrosse. Now, I, I consider myself very lucky because I can actually visualize the scene, literally hear the noise, see the field, and kind of picture what happened. In Ganawaga, when we were growing up in the 50s, horses ran loose in our community. Horses ran loose. I remember playing by the river at my mother's friends, and I was being afraid of this herd of horses coming running. I'd find the biggest rock and jump on it, and uh, I'd be safe. I was like four years old. In those days, you know, you were allowed to run around in the fields. It wasn't like you needed uh, guards or watch, but it was, it was safe. But anyway, I saw that periodically growing up as three, four years old. I must have been about four and a half. I was at my uncle's house named Ganyet Daguerre, which means patches of snow here and there. He put me on his shoulders. He took me down around the corner. There was a, a field there, and I heard this this noise, I just wanted to, I forgot to tell you that. When these horses came running, they kind of made a, a thunderous roar or a, a sound on the ground, on the dirt. And I was always, that was my signal to find cover. So he's got me on his shoulders and we're walking towards this area and there's a whole bunch of people around and I can hear noise and I kind of see dust flying and I hear this feet like really pounding on the dirt. So as we got close, I looked and I saw these men running around with these sticks. So this was the first lacrosse game I saw. So it really made an impression on me because of the beauty of the men running, the avoiding checks, the passing of the ball, the breakaways, the saves that the goalers were making, and the crowd really cheering and, uh, you know, and, and yelling uh, at the participants. So it really stuck in my mind. So I never forgot that first game. So Really, after that, I was kind of hooked every year. When, when's the next game? And in those days, there, was, there were no leagues. Gunawage, Aguazasne, and there's a community a little bit to the uh, south, uh, no, sorry, northwest of Gunawage called Ganasadage. Uh, in English, they say Oka, Oka, Quebec. They had teams, and they would play basically on weekends. They'd visit, and they'd, cut, they'd go to each community and have, have games. So that was the... Uh, a kind of a thrill. As, as young boys, we waited for these games. We went to them. We got sticks between periods, and we went to, uh, to play and participate. So that's kind of how lacrosse kept going. It was a social event. People got together from different areas. And as one elder told me, many marriages were consummated because of the, of the people from Aguazasne, Ganawaga, and Ganasalaga getting together, and also, and also therefore, uh, you know, becoming man and wife and being a combination of Aguazas Hrono and Ganawage Hrono. So that was a, a good thing in, in, in that way. Now, if I go into the 60s, leagues started to be organized. The Kaknawage Indians at the time played at the Montreal Forum for two years. There was a league that happened in the summer right at the beautiful Montreal Forum. So for two years, they, they played in that arena. And that's when Lacrosse, I guess, became more alive in Quebec with, with teams playing uh, communities like Valleyfield, Drummondville, Sorel, Montreal, Ville Saint Pierre, all engaged in these games, and uh, it continued on into the 70s where uh, these t teams played. But we also connected with Onondaga, the, the, our, our brothers near Syracuse, New York, and uh, the Senecas down near uh, what we call. Uh, Cataragus and Allegheny. So they joined the leagues and we actually had an interlocking schedule with uh, native teams and non-native teams. 
basically in the 70s and early 80s. So the evolution kept going with uh, our teams routinely participating in President's Cups throughout the year. Myself, uh, in 1969, I came one game short of winning uh, a President's Cup as we went down 3-0 to Nanaimo, won the next three games, but unfortunately we lost the seventh game, 9-7. to And then a few years ago, in watching a game, Ganawaga played in the final with St. Catharines, Ontario, and lost, I believe, 8-6 or 8-5. So in instances, our community has come close to uh, winning the, uh, the President's Cup. Uh, what happened three years ago when they played St. Catharines, it's roughly half the team was from Ganawaga, and they take imports from different areas. Basically, I guess the NLL, National Lacrosse League. But back in 69, our team was virtually everyone from Ganawaga. So that was uh, kind of uh, a lot of pride in, in who we are and how we, like a little town like Ganawaga, could play a team uh, from Nanaimo and actually put up a good fight and, and almost win the, the President's Cup. But again, we were a bit short and uh, for that reason, uh, you know, I still think about it. I still can see it in my eyes, <laughs> the last game, 9-7. But anyways, it was, a, it was a great experience. Uh, I never, never can forget that. Yeah, it always, <laughs> it always uh, you know, makes you say, uh, oh, could have tried harder, something could have happened, and we could have we won. But nevertheless, uh, I just want to go into uh, just a, a back thought. When I opened, it, it said Kaknawaga, Gahnawage. Now the real pronunciation is Gahnawage. What happened in the 15th century, I guess, with our ancestors trading with the Dutch around Albany, there was a, a town, the original Gahnawage was on the Mohawk River, which is just, just west of Albany, New York. And the Dutch people, I assume, could not say Gahnawage. It came out Kaknawage. So for years and years on the maps and on the, uh, any literature, it would read Kaknawaga. So for many, many years, uh, we were known as the Kaknawaga, again, Indians, which is not correct. Even the Ganawage Mohawks is not correct. If you knew what Mohawk meant, well, I'll tell you. A Mohawk is a word from probably Algonquin, which means cannibal. So my theory is that the Algonquins and the Montagnier saw the French, the French had guns, and said, those people over there are bad people, they are Mohawks. If you go near them, they will eat you, give us your guns, and we'll protect you. So that's what I mean about lacrosse taking a beating in those times where people had to look out more for their lives and their, their well-being in the village, and lacrosse at that time kind of uh, you know, took a, went on the back burner, so to speak. But, uh, uh, okay, that, so that was the part of Ganawaga, Kaknawaga. Now, in the second part, when I say, and I'll get into that as we go on, how the Warriors, the cross players, had an effect on the shaping of Turtle Island. In our creation story, the Sky Woman falls from the sky into the waters and lands on the the birds bring her to the back of a giant sea turtle. The, the little muskrat goes down after a few animals did go down and die to bring up some dirt. And bring it, she brings up, the uh, muskrat brings back the sky woman and she walks on the turtle's back. Hence the name Turtle Island. So I did not want to refer to that part as North America. So in the promo or the little blurb it says Turtle Island. So in many circles, you'll hear Native people refer to North America as Turtle Island. So again, getting back into the area of uh, how it was shaped through warriors, through uh, lacrosse players. As a child, I, I considered myself with my lacrosse stick to be, this was like, very precious. Even in the winter, it stayed in my room and you took care of it. The stick is 40 years old, same age as my son right there. So I use this, uh, son landing right there. So I kept this, I still use it when I practice with my, uh, my field lacrosse team, but it's, it's precious. Somebody mentioned to me that somebody was annoyed because they had to restring it and whatever, but 
I, I mentioned them, I said it's like taking care of a child, something cracks or something breaks, you fix it and you, you cherish it. So this was always uh, in my room, it was you know, kept uh, as a child, you, you, you don't lose it, you, it's more precious than, uh, than a computer, than an iPad. So just to get back to my props, again, 200 years ago plus, I think it was much bigger, uh, it grew into this. And we know that, I didn't have a sample, but um, they were much smaller in, in pre-European pre contact. They were only the, really the size of, of a hand, and really you scooped the ball and you threw it. Now, I mentioned in my opening, I said, the ball is an odziqua, anything like a round object. A fist can be an odziqua. The tomahawk head can be an odziqua. So that ball, which was made of deer skin because it was in the shape of a fist, or a tomahawk head was called odziqua. So when you say swaek, that means to hit it. So in our language, we combine words. So we say de hum tsi They are hitting the object. Odziqua meaning loosely you could say the ball or the puck, but it's, it's an object. So that's what they did with this, and they, they would scoop it and kind of throw it up, throw it forward. And uh, the game you're going to see tomorrow will involve teams of eight against eight. It's the original game uh, predating European contact, and it'll be, it'll be really a, a fine show. So they'll be using sticks like this in, in that game. Now just to, uh, I mean, kind of go over my props. I was proud to receive this eagle feather 30 years ago uh, because as children, uh, and again, I'm going to get to this at the end. I came to a real conclusion in, say, the last year, knowing that I was going to ask to speak at this session. And uh, the things I found out, I'm going to reveal it at the very end. But this was given to me in 1986 from the Grand Council at Onondaga because I took a year off from work to reclaim my language. At the time, we were brought up in English. My parents never spoke English till they were like 10 years old. But we were brought up in, in the English language because we were going to be smarter. We were going to become lawyers. We were going to become doctors. And if we spoke our own language, we were not going to learn that. And this was the thoughts of the, the 40s, which what happened with, with the community. So all I'll say is it was the authorities. There's no blame that I'm putting on anyone. Just the authorities convinced our parents that this is how it should be. So this is a cherished item from, uh, as I say, 1986. I keep it well, uh, you know, well, and when I bring it to school and ask, talk to my students, we always uh, like bring this out. Um, so with that, I just want to go back to the Watani Datsu. Just again, as I said, in doing this research and talking to people, everything is inter intertwined. Uh, the language, the names, the stories I'm telling you. For example, the stick itself. When I did the opening, again, I'm kind of jumping, I didn't explain to you what, what it meant. What I said when I said, when I started, so what Don Sias Gari West says, every one of you listen well. And I gave thanks to all the elements of creation, starting with Ungwe Sun, the peoples, Yetini Stanzi Onzada, the world. Kanegarunyo, the waters. Kudzusu'a, the fish that are in the waters. Then we get to the land. Oterasu'a, the root life. Then the covering of the earth. Ohundesu'a, the grasses. And the natural medicines. So in, it, in, it, in that uh, Thanksgiving, I gave thanks to the, the creator for this stick. Because when I say, Garunda su'a, dana ogre su'a, I'm giving thanks to the young saplings and the trees that are part of the stick. And when I say, the leather comes from Oskanundu, which is the deer, and the gut comes from the, the gut of the animal. So this is a natural object and is maybe one of the reasons why I could never use the plastic stick. It came into effect in the 80s when I was still playing, and I kind of tried it and I just tossed it aside and said, this is the real the real stick. In our language, we say ga, ga, nia, ga, nia, ga, nia. That's the real word for a lacrosse stick. Um, there's a student in my class this year who is a rel relation of mine. 
I just love his name. In our language, Rahawe means he's carrying it. So we put Gahnya with, with Rahawe. His name is Ranyahawe. He carries the lacrosse stick. So when I got him and I, I, his name, I just, I said, do you want to trade names? But he, you know, but Ranyahawe. But no, I'm, I'm satisfied with my name. And I just want to go over how complicated names are. I would say to you, Dawani Datsu Yujats which means they call me the one Datsu. In our language, we don't announce it as my name is, because in our culture, only one person has that name. So you say the one Datsu Yujats. If I ask somebody, I say, not the Yazayats, which means what do they call you? I'm not saying what's your name. I'm saying what do they call you? So my name is the one Datsu. A Wahnida is the cycle of a new moon to a full moon. There are 13 in a year. The same number of squares on a turtle's back. My name means two of those passing at a time. So loosely it could be translated as two months at a time, but because there are 13 moons in a year, it refers to two of those pa the passages of time. So my name comes from an ancestor born in 1741, and for some reason that's exactly seven generations ago. I was fortunate to get my hands on my family tree, tree because the churches, when they moved into the territory along the St. Lawrence, started to do the uh, birth, I guess the birthdays and ber list births of, of children. Um, just to tell you, people obviously lived well in those days. The oldest entry on that family tree is a man born in 1678 and he passes away at the onset of the American Revolution, 1776. So this man lived to be 98 years old. So it just shows you how, I guess, well our people lived with uh, sustenance from the animals, from the, the, the three sisters, Asunida uh, Dagunsa, corn beans and squash. So it was really a rewarding life. And just again, to, to note it, Many of the ancestors in, the, uh, in that uh, family tree lived to be well into their 90s, 80s, so we obviously had a very healthy society. Um, I just want to point out something else. As you see, my uh, dark skin complexion is not coming through in this light, but what has happened is that our nation adopted many uh, people of different nationalities. And sometimes it doesn't come to light. For example, in 1704, I have an ancestor who was taken from the town of Marlboro, Massachusetts after the Battle of Deerfield. Approximately 200 to 250 people were forced to march by the French and Indian allies from Deerfield, Massachusetts, Marlboro, Massachusetts, down to Ganawage, probably about 350 miles in the month of February. My ancestor, who was nine years old at the time, uh, name was uh, Silas Rice. He had two brothers, seven and five. Unfortunately, they, they didn't make it. And apparently many babies and children, and I mean, obviously, in those times, things were cruel. I mean, to force march, a whole town into Ganawaga. But and ev eventually they got there, and uh, many people, after a year or two, expressed when they were given the opportunity to return to, as we, as we call it, Wastaranunga, the United States at the time, which didn't have that name, they refused to go back. They stayed in Ganawaga. And to this day, there's names Williams, and for example, Rice, which was an ancestor of mine. Those names are still carried on in Ganawaga because for, for that very reason. Another uh, just little anecdote. My ancestor, uh, actually my great-grandfather, was an Irish baby who was adopted into the Ganawaga community along with 36 other babies in 1841. So I remember my grandfather, blue eyes, fairly light hair, but never spoke a word of English in his life. And there's so many stories to come from it. My grandfather, quit the Quebec Bridge two weeks before it fell 
because he knew, and many of the men from Ganawaga knew that it was going to fall. Unfortunately, four of his brothers, brother-in-laws, who were my, grandma, my grandmother's brothers, and I, I knew her for four years of my life, lost her life on that bridge along with 33 other men from Ganawaga. So it was really a, a big disaster. But you know, I consider myself fortunate. Perhaps the creator was watching, watching us at that time. Uh, as my mother was born in 1914, so obviously had my grandfather stayed on that job, you know, somebody else would be giving this talk right now. So nevertheless, it, it, it's so many memories that come back. And again, it's the research of, uh, of lacrosse and, and so on. I just want to check my, uh, see, in, in Ganyaga, we say, Doni Joey Stai. Doni Joey Stai really means, it, it's written as what time is it, but it means how many bells have rung. Because we didn't give a hoot about time back in the day. We didn't rush, like if it was raining, we'd say, ah, oh, lacrosse game, we'll make it on Tuesday. Or not Tuesday, we'll make it a day later or ne the next day. So today we're bound by time, we're bound by schedules, we're bound by flights out of here on Monday or whenever. So again, it's, uh, it's a different uh, li uh, lifestyle. Uh, so I went, uh, again, with that Donny Joey style. So how many bells have rung, but we, it's come to mean what time is it? Again, the church bell would ring once on the hour. So, uh, and again, I'm looking. And it's 10 minutes. Okay, now I gotta get into the, the really interesting part. In 1685, there was a man named General um, de Nouvelle uh, with the French army, I guess, in, based out of Quebec, Montreal. He convinced the warriors, the cross players of Ganawaga, to lead his army on a peace mission to Seneca country. Now, see, again, this is another offshoot. I'll try to do it quickly, but there's so much. Seneca is the short version of the real word, which is Sojinu Dawane Aga, the people of the big hills. So because I guess people couldn't say that, it became the Seneca people, who to this day live around Buffalo, New York. Uh, so what happened was, because of the trouble with the fur trade and the five nations at the time, Tuscarora weren't there, the, uh, the French army wanted to do something about the Iroquoian interference in the fur trade. But they told the Coctawagas, as, as they were called, bring us down there, we're going to make peace with them. Now, when you go down to make peace and you bring 3,000 soldiers and cannon, well, there's got to be something up. So the 100 men who went with them kind of saw this, and they sent scouts ahead to warn the Senecas. So what happened was the Senecas burned their villages, burned their crops, and really uh, the Noville didn't, didn't get to kill as many of the Iroquois as, as he wanted to based on an order from, I guess, the king of France. But anyway, many of the Senecas believed that the, the Kaknawagas willingly took the French army down to their territory, but it was under the, the idea that it was a peace mission. So, you know, once they uh, found this out, as I said, they warned them and nothing happened. There was a return to uh, New France, which was the island of Montreal, and that's where this retaliation came in effect in 1689. There's a story, or, well, how it's written, of course, when the natives win a battle, it's a massacre. So it was called the Lachine Massacre. It was actually 1,500 Seneca warriors coming down river to exact revenge on the French army. Apparently the French army went into the walls of Montreal, and Lachine being an island, a city or a town on the western part of the island was burned to the ground. So again, our ancestors did not engage in total warfare, but they saw you know, the fact that they had to burn things down when they destroyed their own villages, and hence they did that with, with Lachine. Again, uh, the cruelty of, of the times, I guess. Uh, so getting back to that story, okay, we're going to jump ahead. It'll come back at the end when I explain, but just keep in mind the uh, the Seneca, the attack on the Senecas, their retaliation, the fact that they're blaming the Kaknawagas, my ancestors, for bringing the French army down into Seneca land. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead to uh, the War of 1812. I did some research on the names of the fighters in there, and I have five relatives. 
again, because I, I was uh, quite out there, I've, uh, I was remembering them and their births, but I, uh, but I can remember Sawah Nowane, which it means like a man of big words. But there was five of them. We researched it on my family tree of my class. We took all the men roughly born between 1740 and 1770, 1780, and we matched it to the list on the monument in front of our local church. And we found five names of these so-called fighters. Now again, if they had not learned lacrosse, little brother of war, and all those skills, as we say, 10,000, they were with a group of 10,000 in all who literally saved Canada from being taken over by the U.S. in 1812, 1813. In other words, they, they fought them to a stalemate. And uh, it was agreed at that point there would be no more hostilities between the U.S. and Canada. And I believe there was no more after that. And the power of the Six Nations was gone after that because we were no longer a, a military force. But in those battles, like around Queenston Heights and Niagara Falls, the, um, my ancestors would you know, go behind a tree rather than take a bullet in the chest, and they couldn't believe how these people would stand in a line and face each other at 20 feet and like kill each other. It just didn't seem right. And there's another little story I want to get into. There's a, a war dance that well, we won't hear here, but uh, occasionally there's a powwow. So what happens is, they beat this drum, and they're watching the soldier. And as the drum's beating, so they see him do this, do this, and then they go, and then they drop to their knees, and they shoot. And then they have 30 seconds, they time it before they can redo a bullet to attack the soldier and do their business. So it's actually a, a powwow dance to commemorate this, this type of skill, I think which we now call guerrilla warfare. So again, back in the day, the, uh, the fighters, the 10,000 fighters who fought with Canada really did a great, uh, I mean, help keep it as, uh, as Canada as opposed to the United States. Okay, now, I'm, I'm jumping, I jumped the gun. Okay, I, I want to refer to a man called Descahe. I'm, okay, I'm jumping back to 1763. Okay, he along with the warriors, lacrosse players of the five nations, led the British army up the pass to get into the Plains of Abraham. It was a secret passage that nobody knew about. Had he not brought them there, as the Skahe said, he's a Cayuga chief, the, uh, I guess the makeup of Canada at the time would have been French because there's no way, apparently, if the British didn't get up on the Plains of Abraham that they would not have won that battle. Now, again, historians would probably say, eventually, though, the British army, because of its superiority, would probably have won maybe in 1792 or whatever. But this decisive battle in 1763 took place. As we know, the generals Wolfe and Montcalm lost their lives in it, and that kind of shaped that part of Turtle Island. So, but yet, in the sky, the chief of the Cayuga said that, uh, you know, had they not, it would have been a French Canada at that time. Now, the, six, the Five Nations always said they would be neutral, but the reason why they, they helped the British is the British guaranteed lands at, for instance, Grand River, which is near Brantford, Ontario. <coughs> it was a nation until 1921 that was dissolved by the authorities for some reason. Also, lands were given around the Gayandanega, which is called Gayandanega near Kingston, Ontario, after the chief Joseph Brandt, whose Kanyageha name was the Gayandanega. So again, because of this promise by the British to honor the loyalty of the some nations who fought with them in the Revolutionary War, many lands were granted in what we call Ontario. By the way, if you're from Ontario, you are from Onyadario. Onyadario is the name, beautiful lake which has turned into Lake Ontario, but it's Onyadario, meaning beautiful lake. So again, there's many words that uh, come from our language. It's just making me think about this. Canada. Jacques Cartier comes off the boat, looks at me and says, what's over there? It's a village. So I go, Ganada Neti, Ganada. So from Ganada, you have Canada. So that's another little story. 
Okay, so we've covered the Seneca attack. We jumped around with 1812 and we jumped around to uh, the sky in 1763. Okay, now I just want to conclude with 1973. Here I am, unaware of uh, any of this history, going to Cataragus, which is a village near Buffalo, New York, Seneca village. We come into Pueblo Cross, I'm 22 years old, practicing an outdoor box, woods all around it. Where's all the fans? You know, nobody's here. Finally, 7.30, they got lights. These people come out of the woods with rocks and bottles and sticks and everything and throwing it at us. And in the game, there was nine fights. It's irrelevant to say who won them, but Kahnawaga won eight of them. But nevertheless, uh, it, was, it was a revenge match. They, they said it's the first time a group of, Gunna, of Kaknawagas came back to this area. I mean, obviously there are men coming to do iron work and to work in Buffalo and so on, but a group. So we bore the brunt of this uh, like attack. And being the manager, not necessarily playing close, but being 22 years old, I had guys turning and saying, we're, that, we're getting out of here. They're going to kill us. This is crazy. But I said, if we leave, we can't put it across anymore. Let's stick it out. Who's coming on the floor with me? So we'd, we'd go on the floor, and I mean, we lost the game, but we held our, uh, I guess, our pride. We played it. And after the game, we're saying, we better go home. We better leave. We, they were all, like, inviting us to come to this community hall, and they had uh, refreshments and food, and they were just kind of, it was that revenge match, like a, a blood match to get rid of their anger. So I actually participated in this, but I didn't know, like, what are they mad about? Because at the time... And again, I'm saying through this, I've learned so much in the last, I guess after 22, as I went into teaching 24, but in talking to elders through lacrosse and through other things, I learned so much. Okay, now I'm just getting down to the, uh, to the very end. We're almost on time. Okay, so what I can say that is in the 50s and 60s, we had zero culture. The authorities literally managed to stamp everything out. Now, when I think back of, of how I was as a child, this is what, uh, I guess, kept me uh, connected to my, uh, my past. There was no teachings, no longhouse. The longhouse was, was considered to be pagans. The authorities had done such a good job that you felt... That, that old stuff was, was pagan. It was, it was not to be, to be, to be uh, learned about and, and so on. But yet, through lacrosse, through the language of my, uh, of my elders, that's the only thing that, I guess, could, you could say we kept our identity in those times. So in, in doing this research, it, I'm, I'm like really proud to say like lacrosse was a, I guess, like a, a force that kept me uh, knowing who I am and, I guess, allowing me to have that pride today in being a Kanya Gehaga. So, again, I, I truly thank lacrosse and, uh, like, there's so much to, to learn. Today was, like, probably, and it's not over, the busiest day of my life, maybe in 30, 40 years. We got up at 5, 6, got the stuff ready. We came to do the field. We said, it's raining. We're going to do it anyway. So I came running in here at 12.40, full of dirt. Got cleaned up and uh, came out here. Then there's a reception. There's a panel discussion. There's other speakers to hear. So I'm just, I'm just like, thrilled because it keeps you alive. The more, like, the more you do, you, you stay alive. Retire when I was 60, but 66 now. Didn't, I didn't retire. Always taught part-time, always continued. And as I told my predecessor at school, who is half my age, but he took over the principalship, I said, uh, and he's very traditional, I said, I want to know when you have your sessions about relearning these things, because I've gone through them, but, and I've learned a lot, but there's so much more to learn that, that I, you know, at 66 don't feel it's too late. It's never too late to learn about those types of things, and I hope to continue. Niyamukowa. Well, I think uh, if there's any questions, uh, we have a couple of minutes. Yeah.
So if there's any questions pertaining to I mean, anything I said or any particular story, uh, feel free to, uh, to ask. Well, it, it, if you go on a native territory, the town is out, kind of out there, and they'll have a box, a box built like in an area where there's no, uh, like just a field. Yeah. So it's a secluded area, and we're like kind of joking, laughing, we're going to have a big crowd tonight. But they, they did come out like running and screaming, but they, they come out and finally like we're, we're warming up and it's getting a little dark, the lights are on, and we see hundreds of people ringing the box. And uh, then we're noticing uh, you know, rocks are flying in our bench area, bottles are flying in our bench area, and we're saying, what the hell's going on? I mean, we're, we're uh, at the time, I think we called ourselves the Mohawks, which was wrong, but they're Senecas. And we're saying, why are they doing this to us? But see, that part of history, I didn't even know about until over the last 15, 20 years since I've been getting into my, uh, my history, my past, and all these stories, they're all coming out now. And there's so much more, but I, I can't tell you everything about, you know, about the state of prelude in, 18, in 1685 when certain things happened. There was more things that happened, but I'm just touching on certain areas. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what they say. Yeah. And certainly in uh, in a lot of native areas, uh, there's still things that are um, are remembered. For example, the, the Algonquins to the uh, north of us, there was a story about something happening 150 years ago. They will not come into Gunnawaga and stay there to this day. It's kind of a, about a story of something happened where there was a death or there was a fight, and they won't come back because they feel there will be revenge. So whenever there's a running event, they'll bring their kids, they'll leave at 5 in the morning, they'll participate, and they'll leave and go home. So it's, you know, it's funny. Any, any other questions or? Um, you talked about keeping yourself for when you see the oral tradition come out. Yeah. How do you keep that, how do you try to keep that alive for the modern day, I guess? Well, I'm a Ganyagaya teacher at school, meaning I teach the language, so often we'll, we'll do uh, storytelling. I mean, it can't be completely in Ganyagaya, but we, um, we talk to the students about stories of the past. So that stories like that are kept alive, and generally they they're rec the re receptive to it, and they like to hear about how things were in the past. Hmm. Anyone else? I was going to maybe tell you something you don't know. Is you were talking about you know like a boy had little thoughts that can kept in his bedroom and everything. Well, I I come from the old Prince there. And Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, we could say Jagenidur. Uh, Jagenidur loosely means, I mean, not loosely, but it would translate as, as wife or partner. And when you break it down, it means the person that I live with. So that's our word in Ganyaga. Jagenidur. So Negi Gaha Yitzkude Jagenidur. The person I'm, I'm with. So it's more so than just that word, she's my wife, she's, it's the person I'm with. Jagenidru. So Ganyaga is very descriptive in, in how you, you say things. It's funny, uh, I was told, when we say it's raining, it's yoganoru, yoganoru. But yogu means it's clear, or it's, you can see it. And noru, ganoru means it's precious. So actually the rain is precious because it gives life to the grounds and the plants and so on. So yoga noru to the kids, well it's raining, I gotta stay inside. But yet, for me, when it rains, I'm, I, I feel happy. It's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean it's a bad day. <laughs> it's a good day. Was there a good day this morning? Uh, well, we, we came prepared. We came prepared to, to do the sticks, and we said, uh, basically, rain or shine. But then on the way, I was thinking, 
Had it been a long time ago, we'd have said, well, this, this, can, this can go on tomorrow. It's like that old term, Indian time. We'll do it when we're ready, when it stops raining, when the sun is shining. We can postpone it because we're not bound by schedules. As we, in our culture, a long time ago, there was no days. You actually went by the moon. The new moon was uh, in January, the, the new cycle. So when we say, that's a, a new year. So we say, Dona that literally means, how many winters have you passed? So everybody's birthday happened on that new midwinter day. And the kids, like I tell them, you only had one birthday. You were all equal. There was no jealousy. You all dressed the same. You, uh, like for in our, in our example, in our culture, there's no word for it. You are beautiful. There's zungwet dio, you're a great person. There's no words to enhance like physical beauty. I mean, in shape, yes, but not to say she's more beautiful than her. There, there, that doesn't exist. So I'm just telling the kids the values of our ancestors who lived in longhouses where there's no word in our language for aunt. Your mother and her sisters and your grandmother and her sisters were all called mother. So I remember as a child calling my grandmother on my mother's side, Ista, which means mother. So as I tell the kids today, if you were in a longhouse, you'd have 10 mothers looking after you. They say, oh, I can hardly stand my own mother. <laughs> how, how, imagine 10. But then again, I tell them, if she, something happened to her, you had nine people ready to take her place. So you were never in a situation where you would not be taken care of and, and loved, which is unfortunate. We see in this day and age, uh, certain children are, are neglected and uh, don't have that opportunity. One other thing I wanted to mention, uh, in our culture I've learned and I knew about this, the Pine Tree Chiefs, it's sort of like the Senate in the U.S. and Canada. I guess a bunch of old folkers like me. But it seems I've been reading lately about if you're appointed by the liberals or by the conservatives or in the states by the Republicans or the Democrats, they can't seem to agree on something. But yet it needs to be something that is good for the nation. And they can't agree on it because they're from appointed by different sides. But the Pine Tree Chiefs looked at it in, the, in, in terms of the goodness of the community and basically, I guess, would agree with the, the, the present council that, that was made up of uh, the, young, you know, the younger chiefs. But the Pine Tree Chiefs, which was copied by the US and I, to an extent Canada, to have a Senate, a body in there to oversee what was being done by the, uh, the I guess, the regulators of law. So again, it was a check, a way to check things. Mm. Lacrosse players, we constantly do this as we're running up the floor, just to make sure your, your pocket is right. And, but it was always uh, hands on. Any, uh, any more questions? So I enjoy it very much. Nyamukola, Jiva Sadahun Sadade, Danuva, Zodehni Guhrori. Nyamuk.